morning, church family. Let's stay in an attitude of worship. Just because the music settles down and gets still, we're still worshiping. There's so many different ways we can worship. One of the ways that we're going to try to worship right now is we're going to take a moment. One of our church family members is a widow. And in 1 Timothy, it teaches us or it tells us to honor those that are widows. To, to meet their need, to help them when they're down and out. So I'd like everybody to, to see what they have in their, their purse, in their, their wallet, in their pockets, maybe some loose change, some loose currency or whatever it is. But we're going to bless this lady. We're going to bless her. We're gonna... Sometimes when you, you get in this situation, you can get into the mully grubs. And it, it has a way to have us focus away from what God can and what He will do. We're going to bless her. We're going to mend. We're going to grow that relationship by this this blessing. So we're going to take a minute. We're going to ask the ushers to come forward. We're going to take an offering uh, the old-fashioned way, I guess, because normally we give through the, the giving center. So take a moment right now and see what you'd be willing to give. We're going to pray. Father, I thank you that you're giving this family an opportunity to meet this need. But I ask that not just that we reach in and put money in the plate and leave it, but I pray that your hand will touch this offering and multiply the offering. I pray that it's not only a blessing to her, but it's a blessing to us. Bless everyone in here that gives and listens to the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. We're going to take a moment to, to watch a quick video. Hey, everybody. I want to share something with you that I've had on my heart these nine months since I've become governor. You know, everywhere that Maria and I have traveled across this great state, we've met with countless numbers of people that come up to me and say, Governor, we're praying for you and for Maria and for your family. I want you to know that we deeply appreciate those prayers because we know that God hears them. We know that prayer accomplishes much. Prayer strengthens our families and it strengthens our communities, strengthens our relationship with our neighbors, it strengthens our relationship with God himself. So because of that, we have decided to proclaim an official day of prayer and fasting for our state on October 10th of this year. On that day, Maria and I will take the day to offer prayers of healing, prayers for forgiveness, prayers of thanksgiving, and prayers of hope for our state and for the 6.7 million who call Tennessee home. We invite all Tennesseans to join with us in their homes, in their communities, in their places of worship, to fast and to pray for God's favor and blessing on the people of Tennessee. You'll hear more about the day as it approaches, and we look forward to hearing how Tennesseans will gather on this important and powerful day. Hey. Amen. Uh, aren't you grateful for a, a governor who loves the Lord? Yeah. The Bible says when the righteous are in authority, the city rejoices. And uh, we, need, we need righteous people in office. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you happen to be visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. And I uh, hope to get to know you, but we want to welcome you. And everybody knows John. Everybody say, hi, John. Yeah, John needs his attention this morning. All right, turn your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 1. <clears throat> and I'm going to continue with, if you're a teenager and you'd like to go with these guys, they go out and meet. So jump up and follow them if you'd like to follow. Uh, yeah, they're not just leaving the church. They actually have a place to go. Hebrews chapter 1, for the last two weeks I've been talking about faith. I'm going to recap a little bit of what uh, I've said on that, and then I've got a few things I want to share with you that are fresh this morning. Do we understand that faith is something that all of us live with? How many of you have faith? Raise your hand. You all have faith. If you don't know, if you're if you if you're not a 
religious person, not a spiritual person, if you don't believe in, in a God or what have you, and you may say, I don't have faith, the answer to that is actually you do have faith. You have faith in something. Everybody has faith in something. You may Your faith might be in yourself, that you believe that you can be successful one day and you're going to make yourself a success. And so you might pour your life into that, striving to become something that you see in your mind's eye you want to be. And you'll tell your friends about it, right? Somebody says, hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, my name's Bob, who are you? And you introduce yourself, and, and, and uh, the guy might say, well, you know, what do you do? This is what men say to each other, right? What do you do? And you'll go into telling them what it is that you do in perspective to what you want to do and accomplish with your life, what you want your purpose to be, right? So watch, what, watch what's happening here. The man who puts faith in himself, who trusts in himself, is first envisioning in his mind what he wants to become, number one. Number two, he's saying from his mouth what he is in his own perception or what his intention is to become and what he wants his purpose to be. He's actually living a life of faith. But we want to, we always tend to take faith and lump it into religion, into Christianity or other faiths, if you will. And we try to make it a, a religious, spiritual thing. But faith is a principle that God put into motion and put into action, and every human being lives by faith of some sort or another. Now, the Scripture says in the Old Testament, one of the prophets said it, and it was repeated, I think, three times in the New Testament, the righteous shall, the just, or the righteous, the just man, the man who's just in God's eyes, who's in right standing with God, shall live by faith. So if you're a righteous man, if you are a spiritual person, a religious person, you believe in God, then that is noted by the faith that you live. So how many people in this room live a life of faith that others would note. They're, they're, they used to say when I was younger, preachers used to say it was kind of a common, you know how people get cliches they say, and it was, if you were ever convicted for being a Christian, if you were taken to court for being a Christian, could you be convicted? Well, could you be convicted for being a Christian? How do you, what do you convict a person over? Two things. What they've done and what they've said. So those who live by faith have a perception of who they are and they put action to it and they put words to it. And that is exactly what God is calling us as Christians to do as believers. If we really are believers, we're going to put words to our faith, right? And we're going to say things that go along with our faith. So for the last two weeks, I've talked to you about faith. The first week we talked about faith's fuel. Everybody say, faith, plural, fuel. And uh, what I discussed with you were five things that fuel faith. Everybody has faith. We all have faith. As a matter of fact, we all have some sort of faith in God. One way or another. Even the atheists have faith in God. Did you know that? Do we have an atheist in the room this morning? Well, y'all laugh, but sometimes we do. And I don't mean it to be facetious. Even the atheist has faith in God. He has faith in God and he acknowledges it when you ask him about God and he gets angry. Does he get angry when you ask him what he wants for dinner? Does he get angry when you ask him, is he married? An atheist only gets angry when you ask him about God. Why? Because he will not acknowledge God that he believes exists. Think about that for a minute. He gets angry, be, and, and I've learned this over the years of witnessing. It's always not always 100%, but I'm going to say my personal experience seems to have been 90, 95%, if I can put a number to it, of the atheists that I've had conversation with about, you know, talking to them about God and, and, and the things, things of the Spirit, uh, probably 90, 95% of them have all had lost a loved one in a tragic way or out of time. 
lost a parent when they were young, lost a child, lost a sibling. And so when I'm talking to, to, to an atheist or even agnostic sometimes, and I, we begin to talk about spiritual things, and they automatically start getting defensive and getting angry. Why? I don't know. I say I do know. Because there's bitterness and hurt in their heart. And they're disappointed in the God who's supposed to be good God, but he let bad things come to my life. Right? And so, and so I will, sometimes I'll go ahead and I'll say, who died? And I've had multiple times people say, what are you, what, what, what are you talking about? Somebody in your life very close to you died out of time, or they died a tragic death. What happened? And boom, they'll start just pouring. My brother, God, I thought something so happened. And, and if you're, God's a good God, then why are you mad at a non existent God? Even the atheist has faith in God, he just won't acknowledge it. And so you and I, we have faith in God, right? If I say yes to that, you're in church. Come on. And uh, so, but having faith in itself is not always going to produce what you're needing and wanting and desiring from God. You've got to do more. You've got to do something with faith. James uh, put it that way, like I said a while ago. I actually quoted part of the scripture. James says, faith without works is dead. So works are a form of fuel to faith. When you've got faith... Uh, Paul said in Romans, he said, for to each one is given a measure of faith. We've all got a certain amount of faith, whatever it might be for, whatever. But we've all got a certain amount of faith. And, and, and so we have this faith to be given a measure. So why does it lie dormant with so many people? And this is what we talked about the first week. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But I do want to go back and recap it because it's taking us to where we're going. So here it is. Uh, and I said five things. If you didn't have them, you might want to write them down. But here they are. Faith is number one, uh, the fuel of faith, what fuels faith, what puts it to action, is seeing the impossible with your mind's eye. And that's what I was talking about earlier. People who just in their personal life, whatever they trust in, they envision that. Whatever it is, they see themselves doing it. It's seeing the impossible with your mind's eye. But as a Christian, the difference is what you see, you attribute the action of it happening to God and not to yourself. That's the first thing. Second thing was speaking those things, and the scripture put it this way, speaking those things which are not as though they were. Calling things that are not as though they were adds fuel to your faith. So you're struggling, believing, you're having a difficult time, believing God is going to do this thing for you, repair your marriage, heal your body, uh, help you pay your bills, you're struggling with it, you put your words to that, and that's a difficult thing to do when you're, when you're struggling. But if you'll put your words with your faith, it will light a fire in your faith. But you've got to do it. And you've got to stick to it. Number three. So it was, uh, number three is searching. So you've got seeing, speaking, searching, seizing the moment, and settling. Searching, being willing to hope for what you asked for. What we talked about was uh, the difficulty in believing for something is we've all been disappointed at one time or another in our perception of what God should have done for us. And so it's hard to hope again when you have something in your life that's really important if you felt like you were let down at some point in your life. Isn't that right? Is there anybody in here who's never felt like God let you down on something? Just be honest with yourself. You got, you know, we need to we need to, we need to think about these things and process them in our mind. The fourth thing was seizing the moment. And I talked about raising the standard. You, these, these are things that faith, fuel your faith. That we need to come to a point to where we say, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to accept less than what God's Word said. And then I seize that moment and I begin to fight for it. I, I get serious about it. And I've done this so many times in my own life where I just kind of meandered along praying and asking God to help me with something. And, and to reach the point where enough is enough, God, your word says, and then you begin to you begin to believe God for that thing. And you just really put your faith out there, right? You seize the moment. The fifth thing was the last thing was settling or believing, accepting, accepting it as done. When you reach that point, a lot of the fight is over. Once you reach the point 
the fight for the most part ends where you don't have this thing going on inside of you that I've got to, got to believe. And all of these things are simultaneous. They, they, they're all working while you're asking and believing God. But you need something, and I need something to fuel my faith to get me through to the next day or until that thing comes to pass. I've got to continue pressing in. Somebody say amen. Y'all got to get me through this introduction so I can get to the message. I know I'm putting you to sleep right now. All right. Hmm. So God is a God of faith. You know that? Everything He does, He does by faith. The Bible says He spoke and the worlds were formed. God created the worlds by His Word, right? And He rested. Then He created man and He rested. Then He created woman. And since then, none of us have rested. She'll take care of me when we get home. Last week I talked about faith's approach. And we said this. You may have the fuel, you may be doing these things and having them working in your life, but if you don't know how to approach God with the fuel, you might not get His attention because faith, the doing and the believing and all that stuff, that's part of bringing us to Christ, but we've got to know how to approach Christ because you're not approaching a formula, a pattern, principles. You're not. You're, it's not what we do or how we do it that gets God's attention. It's this one thing. It's how we approach God. You'll see, need is intended to cause us to come to Christ. When, when you were young, or when I was young, back in the day when kids played outside, I know, I know those of you that are under 30 don't even get that concept. We got out of bed, we rolled out of bed, it was about, I don't know, 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm headed for the door, and I didn't come back until I heard the voice yell when the when street lights started to dim, Lee, Daryl, come on! yelling down the street, and then we knew, get home or get your rear wore out. Something else y'all don't know anything about. And so, but we'd go back home. And so, but the, there's the thing. We didn't, if somewhere in the course of the day, I got stung by a bee, and it was just, oh man, it hurt, and y'all was hurting. I ran straight home to Mama. Mama, I got stung by a bee. She was, Laugh. I mean, she would, you know, give me a hug, give me a little kiss, put some baking soda on it, and say, okay, it's okay, you can go back and play now. And as soon as she said that, the pain couldn't have gone that fast. But I was back out the door and down the street. That need drove me home to mom. And so God has not intended for us to have problems and needs. He intended for us to live in a perfect utopian world, right? That's what he put Adam in. That's what he's taken us back to. But the Bible says, Paul said, but I consider the sufferings of this present age to not be compared at all to the glory that is going to be revealed when I see Christ. The sufferings that we have in this present age, things that we go through in life, that are drawing us toward Him, they're nothing. Uh, I, I, we need to be able, we should have a mindset that no matter what comes or goes in my life, none of that compares to the glory if I just hang in here and get to the end. Now, I didn't want that to sound like they used to, like the old people used to say in church. And, you know, we're just suffering for Jesus. If I get through another week, Pastor, it's gonna, I know I'll get there one day, just, you know, back beyond my day, it was like that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is this. Suffering does come. Difficulties come. Obstacles get in our way. We, we battle things. We're in, the, we're in the spiritual warfare. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers, demonic spirits. That That's what we're fighting against. And he tells us about putting on the armor of God. And the last one of the armor of God, he says, above all, do what? 
Come on, you scholars. Take up the, uh, the, the shield of faith. He's already told us all the things that we need to do to fight, the different pieces of the armor. But he says, above all else, take up the shield of faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Spirit, always. And so, yeah, we've got battles, we've got things that we're facing. But they should be driving us back to Jesus. It should be teaching us how to approach Him. And so, in, in last week's message, once again, um, in the approach, I, get, I told you three stories. If you remember them, the centurion prayed for his son, the woman who had the issue of blood, and the man who was let down by his friends through the roof. Right? And so, the paralytic man. And they all received what they had. The woman with the issue of blood reached for his garment. She said, if I can just find him, if I can just get a hold of his garment, I know I will be healed. So this woman broke through a crowd of people, got a hold of his garment, and the Bible says that very moment, virtue went out of his body and went into her, and she was healed. And what did Jesus do? He stopped and he said, who touched me? Though there were hundreds of people grabbing him. Her approach got Jesus' attention. And what we, what I, basically what I focused on last week, what I intended to bring all this down to was this, that the approach that we're to have is not the, is not the formulas we've been taught. It's that we come to the man, Jesus. That we go to the man, Jesus. Anybody struggling with that word, man? <clears throat> Well, you shouldn't be, because Hebrews calls him the man, Jesus Christ. God came in the form of a man so that he could suffer as we suffer and know what we know, so that he can understand us when we come to him. So when we approach him, we're not thinking of a big God off in the sky who's never had an issue of anything because he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and he's God and he's all that. We're coming to the visual effect of of God who came in the flesh who understands us and we go to the man who is God right God don't shout me down when I'm preaching here alright so anyway you're thinking when are you going to get off recap and get to the message well the message is only two points and, and it, so I've got to spend time on this right there are just a few things I want to say the man, the paralytic that was let down through the roof, uh, his friends understood that he had to be brought directly before the face of Jesus. And this is what I'm talking about. That, that when we have a need, we sh we've got to get past the concept that God, fix me, fix me, help me, help me, give me, give me. We've got to get all that. And we've got to realize that what he's saying is, I just want you to come home and acknowledge me. The Bible says, in all your ways, acknowledge God. Lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. Acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. He's saying, look, I just want you to come to me. He didn't put the bad on us, but He causes all things to be brought to bring out good. If we turn and we go to Him. And so the way we approach Him is the important thing. People... Uh, People conjure up every kind of way in the world to approach God. Some people crawl on their knees upstairs of pyramids, literally till their knees, knees bleed with hooks and bowls in their back over in the Orient, trying to find God. They're approaching God, and that's the only way they know to do it. Self-inflicted suffering and pain, they think, gets a hold of God. Other people walk for hundreds of miles literally hundreds of miles to their feet are worn to get to a special temple or a particular river or a certain city because they think in that approach they can find God. Then there are those people who approach God like Americans who think that intellectualism is how I'm going to find God. And so they try to understand Him. Right? Right? So, where does America go to find God today? No, not to church. To the God of Google. Little G, of course. 
This is a problem for us Christians. That the world Google, we Google everything now. And when people want to know about God, they Google God. And guess who answers their questions? The Hindu, the Muslim, the Mormon, the Jehovah, Jehovah Witness, uh, Hare Krishna group, uh, all of the other religions. And, and, and people don't know how to approach God. And we need to understand how to approach God. It's that you can literally go to God in prayer with faith and God will answer you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They hear his voice. God will answer you if you will go to God and not go to everything else in the world. If the world says this is where you find God. You're never going to understand God intellectually until you give up on your intellect and you seek him spiritually. And if you don't know what that meant, it's because you don't know what it meant. And if you're not going to know what it means until you give up on yourself. And you say, God, what about it? What about it? It's called faith. It's believing in things that you cannot see because God said they were there. So turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. You're probably already there. That's why I told you you were going to read the verse that I didn't read, right? Hebrews chapter 11. And this is one of the main places that we see, uh, that we use typically when we're talking about faith. And Luke, the writer of the book of Hebrews, is going to break down faith a little bit here for us. Faith is, is kind of like fire. It's like burning. Let me say this to you because a lot of times we don't understand this. You can feel your faith. People will say, faith is not a feeling. Faith is a belief. And it is a belief. But I believe that you can feel faith. You know, people also say, love is not a feeling. Love is, love is not a feeling. Love is action. That's true, isn't it? But I don't want to be in a love relationship where I don't feel anything either. And it's the same way with faith. Faith is not feeling, but you can feel your faith. And what you feel in your faith is a fire burning in your soul. It's a fire. Faith is like a fire. And you say, man, I've been trying to believe for something. I just can't get it. And you don't have the fire yet. I know you've never heard this before, so hang with me. You can stone me when I'm three, but you don't get it. But faith is fire. It burns in your soul. When you, here goes the old, the old time he's saying, when you get the faith, you will know it because you'll also feel it in your soul. Now, the Mormons have a thing that they call the burning of the bosom. Anybody ever heard of the burning of the bosom? Y'all are not good Mormons. Okay, this couple, yeah. Kevin and Jackie pastored the church in a Mormon town for 10 years. And they believe in the burning of the bosom. What, they, what the Mormons say is when they have their enlightenment, their experience with God, what we would call salvation, that there's a burning, a fire-like sensation goes off in their abdomen. They say they literally feel it. And I just want you to know that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, because they base their salvation on a feeling. And we're not basing our belief on what we feel. But the feeling will follow the belief. And what I'm talking about is this, a burning in your soul where you've, been, you've got a need, you've been coming to God. It may be that you need to be saved. <laughs> Maybe that you need something else in your life. But you've been going to God and it's just like it's just not working. And then all of a sudden, as, as uh, Roman says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All of a sudden, faith comes to you and you find yourself believing it. And when you do, it's like somebody just lit your fire. And you, man, all right, I, I got this. I've got this. And you can't explain it. And so somebody says, well, show me that in the Bible. All right, thank you. I guess I will. Y'all remember the men walking down the road to Emmaus? 
and Jesus had just been crucified and died. He was resurrected, but nobody knew it yet. And they're walking down this road, going to this town of Emmaus, and they're all upset because they're thinking that they thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah and going to take over and be the king, and now he's been crucified and buried. And they're like, you know, we thought this was going to be it. So it turns out it's not. So Jesus, now resurrected from the dead in his resurrected body, appears to them and starts walking with him down, down this road. He just walks up, catches up with him. He says, yeah, what are you guys talking about? And they start saying, you know, well, we thought, and they tell what they were thinking. And Jesus begins, the Bible says, to preach to them about himself from all the things said in the Old Testament by the law and the prophets. So what Jesus told us was, number one, in the Old Testament, it all speaks of Christ. And it said, beginning with the law and the prophets, all the way through, he began to talk to them and to teach them about the Messiah. They didn't know it was Jesus until they got to a house later on down the road and they asked Jesus to stay the night. He stopped and stayed there with them for the evening. They fixed dinner. They began to eat. And the Bible says when they broke the bread, which was symbolic, right, of, of Jesus' life being broken for us, it says that when they broke the bread, their eyes were opened. And they knew that it was Jesus, and he vanished. If that's not the coolest thing in the world, wouldn't you like to be sitting at the table and dude's gone and you just realized it was God and he's been walking with you all day? Hello? And the scripture says they looked at each other and one of them said, Man, our hearts were burning while we walked with him on the way. King James put it this way. Did not our hearts burn within us as we walked with him on the way? Yeah, their hearts burned. Why? Because there was an anticipation building when he was preaching the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And when he began to preach the word, faith started rising up. Fire started burning inside of them. And they're like, man, you know, I, he's, he's telling us these things. And then all of a sudden he's gone. They realize that's Jesus. Come on now. And faith was burning in them. I don't want to say to you, once again, if you don't have the burning of the soul and the spirit and the fire of God, if you don't have the fire of God in you for in regard to the thing that you're believing for, you need to go after God and say, God, where's my faith? Where's my faith? Give me faith. We used to sing a song around here, Give Me Faith. I remember that Enos singing all the time. Give me faith. Because we know that we don't have the strongest faith. Jesus addressed faith several different ways in different people. So one, he said, O oh, ye of little faith. You know how much little faith is? It's little. To others, he said, he said, uh, you, uh, let's see, how would he word it? But he, but he said that this particular person, the centurion, he said, I've not seen such great faith in all of Israel. There's little faith, there's great faith, there's much faith in there, and uh, there's probably more faith if you dig deep enough. But anyway, uh, faith comes, it comes to us, and it's proportionate to what we're willing to believe our God will do for us. And what you're willing to believe is directly, uh, directly connected to how much you believe He loves you. So people who have broken hearts will have very difficult times receiving anything from God because they don't believe that they can be loved anymore. And if you can't believe you can be loved, you can't believe anybody will give you anything. And if they did, you wouldn't trust them anyway. But you've got to get your hearts healed. And so Jesus talks about that. The Scripture talks about that. That it's, He calls Jesus the healer of the broken heart. Take what I just said and let's put it back on the atheist concept. Who has a more broken heart than an atheist? You say, well, you don't know that. I absolutely do. You go talk to any atheist about God, almost all of them will be angry by the time you get through talking. Bitterness starts coming up in their heart because they're broken, they're hurting, and their pride is trying to put up this facade that I'm bigger than this whole concept of God. I am my own God. That's what they literally say now. I am my own God. You can rise to a higher level of consciousness where you realize your Godhood. That's the New Age movement. Guess what? When you get there, if you do, you ain't going to be no bigger than I am. Hello? 
let me just make this real easy to understand. Everybody dies. And that's the period. And it says, and you weren't God. Because if anybody could be their own God, they would never die. Who would let themselves die if they could be the God of their own world? Hello? That's not going to happen. And so Luke said about faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, right? Everybody knows that verse, right? It's the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. When we look at this, and that's the only verse we're going to really, really look at. I'm going to be through with you in a minute. Maybe two minutes. Maybe three. Okay. Luke's definition. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. This verse in itself you can pull out all kinds of truth and understanding about what faith is. He's telling us what it is. And the first thing he says is, and some of you are from a faith background, uh, word of faith type church. I know some of you are, and some of you are, and some of you are. And so you've already heard this taught in depth, I'm sure. Our congregation, I don't teach on faith in that way very often, maybe once a year or something like that. So this is not something that is as common as it is for you. So you guys hang with me, but here we go. Faith is, the first thing he says is now. Everybody say, now faith is. And so what we learn from that is, and it's true, when is faith? Faith is now. Faith is not what God might do in two weeks from now. Faith is now. You say, well, what does that mean? It means this. If I say, I'm believing, and I am believing God to touch and to heal and fix my back, and I've been battling these issues for the last couple of weeks again, and I told you that last couple of weeks, and so, where's my faith for healing? My faith is now. Oh, good. Is, is it all gone? Are you better? Not yet. Ooh, you just said something negative. No, I told the truth. Hello? The Bible does not say, be stupid and, and deny and ignore what is obvious. It does say this, put your words where the word is. Speak the word as truth regardless what your circumstance is. When I say faith is now, I am healed now, even if I don't feel it. And that is faith. Faith says that can be, even though this can be at the same time. Well, that don't make sense to me. Well, no, and you're probably never going to get anything in. Until you accept it. Because if you don't accept that fact, that reality, you will walk away from your prayer and say, obviously faith ain't now because I didn't get it. And so people come to the altars, we lay hands on them, we have anointed them with oil, we pray the prayer, prayer of faith, and they go home with a headache still, and they're like, well, I guess I didn't get it. No, you got it now. Unless you let go of it. You know, and that sounds like some crazy religious ideology. And it absolutely is. But it's the truth. <laughs> I'm obviously having a lot more fun than y'all are. So, the moment we accept it, it becomes faith. Like it's a moment of salvation. When we believe we're saved... It's not two weeks later when you get saved. It's, salvation is the, mo it's the coolest thing for me. Do y'all understand that when, when, you take the, when you take the opportunity to share Jesus with somebody and you lead them through the sinner's prayer and they get saved, do you understand that that is as major a miracle as a missing leg growing out? It's actually greater because it's an eternal thing. How many of you have ever had the opportunity to lead somebody to Jesus? I mean, really, it was the real deal. First of all, is that not the coolest thing you've ever done in your life? And secondly, did it not shock the heck out of you when they got it? It's a miracle. I'll never forget a guy I prayed for. We were, we were downtown Dallas, Texas, on around Lemon Avenue, and I forget the other street. It's where all the gay bars are, and men are walking the streets, 
practically new speed speedos. It's just it's just really base nasty and sin. I'm just telling you the truth. And we when I was in Bible college, we'd go down there. Actually, after I got out of Bible college, I still went. But we go down there, we stand on the street corners, we preach to these guys. We didn't preach at them. We didn't preach down to them. We shared Jesus with them. And they would say to me, that it was all, often the one I would say, you're just saying that because we're homosexual. And I'd say, you're homosexual? <laughs> See, I didn't, I didn't know that, but you told me that. But that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to ask you one question. How's your spiritual life? Boom. Drive a nail to the heart because we all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Faith is the substance of things to hope for and the evidence of things not seen. And I remember on that street witnessing to a guy, and it was a prolonged conversation, and man, I was just, I was on a roll. I was. I was young and could talk fast then, and, and you know, I was going, man. I was going quote scriptures like a machine gun back then, and and got to the end. It's like, would you like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He said, Yes, I would. I'm like, Yeah, awesome. And then, and then, my humanity jumped up, and I said, Well, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And you just pray what I pray. Now, if you don't feel anything, don't you worry about it. This is all by faith. And I start giving this big disclaimer, right? Y'all not human like I am, right? And so I, and I'm giving this big disclaimer. He said, yeah, 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 that's fine. And so I said, so let me lead you. So I lead him through a prayer. I get th through praying. I open my eyes. Dude's got tears running down his face. A shocked look on his face like he just saw an angel or something. And I said, again. Now, if you don't really feel anything, you, he said, I do, I do. And he just unleashed, telling, exclaiming what God had just done in his life. He said, I feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders. I feel like, and he just got so descriptive. It's also cool when you lead people to the Lord, how they use the same descriptive terms. Have you noticed that? Same term, terminology when they give their life to Christ. Because we all had the same thing. The guilt of sin. It's like all the sin, the weight's been taken off my shoulders. It's like, I've, I've had people say things like, I don't know, it's like the whole world has been lit up. It was all dark. I mean, just all these, plain old, oh, I just came into the kingdom of God terminology. And I was the one most shocked. After an hour's dialogue of what God could do in his life. Right? Come on now. It must not excite you like it does me. It's a miracle. Your being here this morning is a miracle. It's a miracle. You say, no, it ain't. I decided to go to church. No, no you didn't. God woke you up. <laughs> the book of Acts says, for God has chosen from one blood, talking about Adam, from one blood, all men to dwell on all the face of the earth. God made from one man everybody to dwell on all the face of the earth. Everybody says, yeah, okay, that's what the Bible says. It, but it goes on, it says, and he has pre-appointed their times and their habitations. Certain times of visitation in their life. Days of visitation. Moments when God is going to come bursting into their life at certain places. You're not here by chance today. You're here because God brought you here. Now, if you're not a believer, you may be here because this is the day He's going to confront you and He wants to meet you personally. He's chosen. He's pre-appointed your times and your habitations, your places to be. If you're a believer, you say, I've been saved 40 years. I got myself out of bed. I just know how to do that now. That's true. But it's still His Spirit working in you that keeps telling you, I need to stay connected to the body. I need this stuff. I need these people. I need this worship. I need this Word. I, I, you know, it's God in you who both works and wills to do, Scripture, according to His good pleasure. You, you, you and I think 
I, I just did a great deed this week. I did so-and-so. The Bible says, no, you didn't. It was God in you that worked in you to make you will, want to, do the good thing, or you wouldn't have done it. Furthermore, God is working and willing in people that don't even know him, and they're doing good stuff, and they don't know it was God. Oh, come on, I'm going to get outside of your thinker right now and take you to somewhere. Do you know that every good deed any human being has ever done in his life, Christian or Buddhist, was all done by God? Scripture says, there is none good, no, not one. A guy walked up to Jesus one time and he said, good teacher. And I asked him a question. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but the Father in heaven. James said, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow of turning. In other words, God is light and, and wherever he turns, it's all light because he's light. And that's a whole other ma matter. But God is light. There's no shadow he sees, He illuminates everything. All that is good comes from Him. All that is evil comes from below. And how did I get on that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The word evidence means revelation. Faith is a substance, that means confidence. That word in the Greek could have been confidence. Faith is the confidence of things hoped for. It's this thing that comes to you, this fire that burns in your soul that says, okay, go ahead and accept it as done, though you don't see it. Let me, tell, let me just give you a good picture of faith right here. Watch this. How many of you order, how many of you buy stuff offline? Okay. When you go online... Let's say you're going to buy a flat screen TV. You go online and you pull up your website and you go to Amazon.com and you bring it up and you go to television. Da, 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 well, you go to IT or technology or you bring it down and you go to television, flat screen, uh, 60 inches, da da, 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 You go all this work and you get all the way down. That's the one I want. It's a, it's a Sony. Because everybody knows you can get Sony if you buy a TV, right? And so you get down. You get the Sony. And you say, hmm, 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 bing. And you push on Sony. And it says, bing, number one. Add to cart. Bing, goes to your cart. What does it say about your final purchase or something? And you bing, and it goes to your page. You got to enter your, and you enter your information, and you enter your card, and you enter your name, and you verify that you only want one, and that you still want the one, and you push the icon or whatever it is and PayPal pops up and says congratulations your order has been processed and something inside of your psyche changes doesn't it come on you say okay it's done but you don't see it you don't see a flat screen TV you had a visual aspect of what you wanted. I wanted to look like that one. But you've not seen your TV. But you believe that somewhere in the great by and by over in Hongqing, China, somebody's building a flat screen or already built it and it's in your name. And you own it because they got your money. Right? Faith is the substance of the thing you're hoping for that you have not seen. What just happened is you've got faith for that. Now, there's a word in that sentence, in that verse that I've, I've, I've heard people talk about faith is now. Faith is the substance. Faith is the evidence. Faith is hope for. And, and all those words, I've heard them broken down. I've heard them talk. But I've never heard anybody talk about another word that's in that verse. And that's what, and that's what I want to talk to you about. And that's the end of what i got to say. So here it is. It's the word thing. Everybody say thing. Nobody ever talks about thing. Faith is the substance of things. Hope for. And the evidence of things not seen. 
It is the substance. It is the thing. When you apply faith in God to answer your cry, the thing manifests instantly. It is the thing. Come on, nobody got this yet. I can feel it. Nobody got it. Faith, Daisy, is the thing. Faith is the thing. I'm going to say it until somebody gets it. Faith is the thing. The thing's not the thing. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible says faith is the thing. When I was in Bible college, I started playing guitar. I bought me a guitar. <laughs> it was electric. And, I, I, you know, so it was my first guitar. I wanted an amplifier really bad, so I started praying for a PV Classic. <laughs> Where's uh, Ernie at? PV Classic. All right. So I wanted a PV Classic. This was a million years ago. So I, I went to the music store. I saw it. I loved it. I had this image in my mind of a PV Classic tube amplifier. And I started praying, God, I want this PV Classic, but I don't have a stinking dime. But I believe you can give me a PV class. Two couple of months went by, maybe three. I got a phone call out of the blue from a man that my dad had worked for 20 years before that I had never heard from in my entire life. And he said, hey, he, he, he owned a trailer park. He said, hey, he said, I don't know why I'm telling you this. Maybe you heard something through my mom or my dad. Yeah, I was playing guitar or whatever. He said, I don't know why, really. I'm, I'm telling you. He said, but listen. He said, somebody moved out of one of my rentals, and they left an amplifier, and you can have it if you want it. I said, what is it? He said, it's a PB Classic. Thank you very much. I'm in Waxahachie, Texas. He's in Montgomery, Alabama. I got that dad, you <laughs> But God gave me that amp. Do you know how many different kinds of amps there are? It was the amp in pristine condition that God told that renter, just leave that amp. When I believed that God was answer, would answer that for me, it was over there. Faith was the fact that it was there. And God has your answer now. Faith is now. Now faith is. I didn't have that amplifier in my possession, but God had it in his possession. It was in Wongcheng, China. Right? What do you need from God today? What do you need? Maybe you need an answer from God. Maybe, maybe your thing is right there. It's the constant battle. Faith. Maybe you just need an answer. And maybe it's time you just quit needing an answer. And said, okay, Lord, I'm going to give you the opportunity to prove yourself. I won't go there like I've seen a lot of preachers do, but I couldn't take you real quick to, if you really want to prove God, it's time to take a special offer, right? That was my great opportunity. Man, I've never brought you to a point where I could have gotten money. Y'all understand I'm kidding, right? We got our giving station back here. That's between you and God. And by the way, you guys are so faithful and so honoring in that. It's amazing how, how you guys just honor God. We don't have to ask for money. We took a special offering to a widow today. But your giving and your tithes and your offerings, you guys are faithful to that. Because of that, we're helping people. We're preaching the word. We're reaching out. We're helping widows. We're helping yeah, I told somebody this week that very few people in the church have any idea who all we have helped financially in the last six months in the, in the numbers of the thousands of dollars. But y'all don't know that. Y'all don't know. That's, that's not to get praise from anybody but, but from God. You guys donated that. You, you, you gave that money to the Lord. And it came from our general fund in the form of checks to people in need. Y'all don't y'all most of y'all don't know that. But yet you have given faithfully. And now I'm gonna pass the plate. No, I'm not.
But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, right now, what we have to do if we're going to receive from God is we've got to say, Lord, number one, I'm never going to understand this. I'm never going to get it. But I, I'm, going to, I'm going to step out in faith, and I'm going to ask. And then I'm going to let you fuel that faith when I put my words there, when I put my actions there, when I do the things I'm supposed to do, when I seize the moment, when I get serious about this thing, and when I settle it, that it's in the Word, and I'm going to accept that as true. And then I'm going to approach you, because this is not about the thing I need. It's not about, it's not about a, pro, a, pro, a process of getting the thing I need. It's about me meeting with you. It's about you revealing yourself to me, because now we're talking eternal matters, not temple things. Right? And then finally, it's that I'm just here to meet with you. And I know you love me. And you're going to put some, some uh, baking soda on my meat pizza when I come home. So stand with me if you will. And let's pray. I'm going to ask a couple of different questions. You can leave your eyes wide open. Nobody to hide from here. We all know you're there. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, if you have struggled with the issue of faith, quote unquote, meaning your trust and your belief that God is the good God who loves me and who really does exist, as the scripture says, they that, they that, they that uh, come to God must believe that He is. That's the approach and believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You say, I've, I've just had a hard time believing. I want to believe, maybe. Maybe you do. Maybe you've struck, Maybe it's just a struggle for you to have faith. But this morning, you're willing to say, look, I'm going to lay down my fight against God. And if he's real, and if he'll reveal himself to me, I'll come to him today. And we call that salvation because you'll meet him and you will have that supernatural experience I told you about a while ago. I've watched it hundreds of times as a pastor, but greater than that, I've experienced it in my own life. I got saved when I was seven. I came up out of a baptistry tank. And that's when I was really born again, was when I went under the water. I, I, that's just how God did it with me. I came up and exploded with joy. I mean, it was like I was a new creation, as the Bible says. All things pass away. All things become new. I'm still Daryl. I still battle temptation. I still have issues and problems in life. But my trust, my belief, my core belief in God never changes. Never changes. Never. I hear people say things like, well, everybody doubts sometime. And I'm going to tell you, that is a lie from the pit of hell. I don't. I hadn't doubted God since I was seven years old. I'm talking about His existence. Now, I've doubted His willingness to help me sometimes. But I've never doubted his existence. I absolutely believe it. And because I have, I have absolutely met, uh, witnessed miracles and miracles and healings. And I've watched demons come out of people. I've watched God send us money in the mail to the penny that we needed when we needed it. Over and over and over, I have witnessed God in action because my faith in him will not waver. It's as solid, it's as real as the skin on my body. And I can't tell you what, I, I can't explain it. I can't make sense out of it other than to tell you it's true. And to tell you, you can have the same thing. If you will come to Jesus. So now I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes so that you can shut yourself in His presence. And we're not going to be concerned about anybody looking. But right now, if you're the guy or the girl, or the lady, or the child, or the teen, or whatever, who says, you know, I've never really had an experience with God like that, but I want that. I want that. Then in a moment, I want to lead you through the prayer I led that guy through. And it's not the prayer, it's the approach to Jesus. But I'll lead us as a congregation, we'll pray it together. And if you've never prayed that, never asked Christ into your heart, never experienced this relationship I'm talking about, then to do that with me. Second question I, I want to ask, and then we're going to pray. You're here. You heard the word today. God spoke to you and said, I need, I need that right now. 
I need to take a step of faith. Pray with me, Pastor. Pray with me, church, for the thing I'm believing for. I need to go to the next level with God. I want to see the face of Jesus and find my need met. If that's you, lift both hands up to the Lord because you're just surrendering to Him. You're coming to Jesus. And I'm going to pray right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I pray first of all for these whose hands are uplifted. Lord, you see. You see. God, you're your children. You see your people. These are your people, the sheep of your pasture. You shepherd them. You love them. You care for them. You've provided for them. There's no need that they have, that we have, that you haven't already provided us in the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. He took everything to the cross, and he nailed it there, and he was raised from the dead in a perfected body. And the Bible says the same spirit that raised him from the dead, if it dwells in us, it'll quicken our physical, mortal bodies. We can have health, healing, deliverance, prosperity, all the needs that we have, they're provided for us. And right now, say this with me, in Jesus' name, I receive my need met. And I thank you, Father, for meeting with me today. I've come to kneel at your feet. I'm looking into your face. I'm here with you. Thank you for being a father to me. Thank you, Lord. Now you confessed it. You saw it in your mind. You confessed it. Now, now you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hope without fear. You're gonna seize the moment and you're gonna settle it in your soul. The last question was this. Those of you who have not made Jesus Lord of your life, or you're not walking with him right now and you're ready to get that right, lift your hand up quickly. I'm gonna pray for you. Lift your hand up. All over the room. I know there's more out here. I don't know who's who, but I just sense my spirit. Just raise your hands up. We're gonna pray for these. This is no condemnation for anybody, but let's all pray. Once again, so nobody feels uncomfortable, let's just lift our hands up and pray this prayer together because we all need it. And just pray with me out loud. Congregation, let's do this on behalf of those that are coming to Jesus for the first time or to renew their, their, their relationship with Him. Let's just pray it right now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Your Son, Jesus, I come to You. I need You. I need Your life to take charge of my life. I ask you to forgive my sins, to wash me of all the ugly stuff that I have done wrong, and replace it with the good that you are. I am a new creature. All things pass away. All things become new. Thank you for saving me today. I am a Christian. I am filled with the life of God. Jesus name I'm a Christian thank you Lord for saving me amen let's just praise the Lord for a moment amen thank you Lord praise the Lord amen so I, and I'm gonna, I keep I told you 12 times I was gonna close I'm sorry I've kept you all day uh, I'm not sorry thank you I just want to say this last thing to you uh, whatever you're believing for at some point, you need to confess to someone else that you got it. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. If you got saved, if you gave your life to Christ for the first time, if you renewed your life, you need to tell somebody, say, man, man, God is working in me and he moved on me today and, and he's doing something new and I accept that. If you got, if you're believing for healing, tell somebody, I am healed in Jesus' name. Matter of fact, let's just tell everybody right now, I am healed in Jesus' name. All right, whatever your thing is, tell somebody, share it with them, and then you can tell them how you got it, and they can get it too. God bless you all. Have a great day. Join a small group. We have Martin's home group tonight if you want to join us. We'd love to have you at my house. Bring finger foods or desserts. We don't want that kind of food. Good question.